You're watching System for Survival in the 21st Century with Dr. Ron C. Smith on the System for Survival Digital Video Network. a new day dawning fear fighting pain and problems will soon expire hope joy love will emerge victorious but to get there you'll need a system for survival They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? I wrestled with that as I was writing this song. It's just called Wait On You.
Good evening. We're here again to talk about creation health, these eight simple principles that will help you live a more abundant and a lengthier life. Jesus said, I have come that you may live life, what? To the fullest. Tonight, we want to talk about interpersonal relationships, how to create a, a full and happy life. Dr. Dean Ornish, he said this, I am not aware of any factor in medicine, not diet, not smoking, not exercise, not stress, not genetics, not drugs, not surgery, that has a greater impact on our quality of life, incidence of illness, and the premature death from all causes than having love and intimacy in our lives. A third of people in the United States today have reported feeling lonely. 25% of Americans have no one to confide in. 29 million live alone. In fact, loneliness is becoming a major disease in America today. And when that happens, bad things happen. There are, there's a three to five times greater risk for heart disease if we're lonely. Loneliness and isolation affect our health negatively. In fact, it can increase our chances of premature death by up to 500%. Loneliness increases drug and alcohol abuse, smoking, overeating, overworking, depression, and that premature death by possibly 500%. Just a healing touch is so important. Those who enjoy regular, satisfying touch, maybe that's a, a pat on the back, a warm hug, they seem to enjoy the best of health in all realms. Their hearts are stronger, their blood pressure is lower, their stress levels are decreased, and overall tension is reduced. In fact, I love this little story. You see here two preemies born prematurely. Two, two girls, two sisters. One of them was thriving and, and doing well, while the other sister was not. She was not eating. She was, she was not thriving. And finally, her nurse, and just thinking she would try something, she decided instead of keeping them in separate incubator cribs, she would put them together in one. And you see the healthier, the thriving sister. She reached her little arm over and, and, and she, she put it around her sister. And it wasn't long after that before both sisters were thriving and growing and both were out of any danger. The power of touch. It's been discovered that there are benefits in having pets as well. In one study, one year after those who had been hospitalized with chest pains or a heart attack, it found that only 6% of those pet owners died compared to 28% of the patients who did not own pets. And this finding was independent of, of anything else, such as the severity of the heart attack or exercise or other known factors. So tips for healthy relationships. Open up positive communication, including encourage somebody. Every day, reach out to someone and provide some encouragement to them. Take time to be there for one another, for your family. Don't forget that healing touch. Forgive one another. Pray for those who hurt you. Have a positive attitude about your relationships and, and be flexible in order that you can increase that positive relationship. And finally, don't play fair. In other words, if someone hurts you, don't believe that in order to be fair, I have to have revenge. Don't be fair. Exchange bad for good. John D. Rockefeller said this. He said, giving is the secret of a healthy life. Not necessarily money, but whatever a person has of encouragement, sympathy, and understanding. So make time for others. Send them a card. Call someone special on the phone. Set a lunch or dinner date or just simply give somebody a Christian hug. Remember, 
And I love this one. It's better to eat Twinkies with your friends than to eat broccoli by yourself. Connection is so important. So tonight, again, I want to give you a prescription. Tell your family that you love them. Don't just do it periodically or sporadically. Tell them every single day. Get together with a friend, at least, at least once a month, if not more. Write a letter of appreciation to somebody who deserves it, and I can assure you, they're going to be surprised when they get it. And just remember, creation health is about progress, not perfection. But tonight, you are only one choice away from living a better life. And what is that choice tonight going to be? I pray that choice tonight is going to be increasing, enriching, and establishing new and better relationships. Because when that happens, you will live your life to the fullest. And that is what Creation Health is all about. Good evening. Welcome to another night of System for Survival. I pray you joined us for our wonderful worship service this morning. I thank each and every one of you that came out. And I want to thank all of you guys that have been registering night after night. We want you to register. When you do, you lock yourself in to win our grand prize, a $100 Visa gift card. You give me a chance to get to know you. You can have a Bible counselor contact you within 48 hours. They will enroll you in our community Bible survey where you will get a certificate of completion and a $25 Visa gift card. We want to know the best way we can help you survive. So make sure you go to systemforsurvival.com and tune in and register every night. To watch our live streams, the easiest way is just go to youtube.com. In the search bar, type in System for Survival. One word, no spaces. Click on the first link, and it will bring you to where you need to be. Let's bow our heads and invite God's presence in this place this evening. Our Father God, we invite you in this place. God, go through the technology. Go through the computers. Go through the phones and speak to each and every one of us. Let us hear your word and yours alone. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We have a great program and message for you tonight. Thank you, Josiah Ruff, for that music. And I've been so blessed in learning by our finance and health programs. Thank you, Elder David Friedman. Thank you, Elder Jim Davidson, for your wonderful presentations. Dr. Smith has another powerful message for us tonight. But right before he comes, Let's bring up Sister e. Palmer, Sister Kimberly Palmer, who has been blessing us night after night. And after she sings, the next voice you will hear is Dr. Smith. Hear ye him. Well, 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 
the Lord will have your wisdom and your understanding. Oh, you see, we lack the very love you shown in your son. And though we falter in our, our ways, can we stand so much to gain? So give us direction from above, cause we Good evening and welcome once more to a system for survival in the 21st century. Delighted that the members of this wonderful community of Florida City, Homestead, and the greater Miami area and beyond have joined for this wonderful opportunity to our pastor of the church community, Pastor Ron Smith. Thank you for consummate commitment, dedication, and leadership to the cause of sharing Jesus with the world. Tonight, I wish to share a subject the return of Jesus. Space launches have always captured our imagination. But a few years ago, it was the re-entry of the Columbia Space Shuttle that caught our attention. The astronauts were coming home. It was a journey like many others. And maybe we took their safe landing for granted. Then the unthinkable happened. We were stunned and shocked. Seven people had their lives snuffed out in a moment. Their families and friends were devastated and grieved over their loss. Tonight, I want to talk about a space journey that will not end in disaster. A journey that will not only begin well, but end well. Our commander is going to get us home. He's coming to take us on the most fantastic space journey imaginable. Past our nearest neighbor, the moon, a quarter million miles away, past the sun, 93 million miles from Earth, past the planets, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn, higher and still higher, 
past the nebula and up through the open space in Orion. He's taking us home. And there's one thing for certain. One thing for certain. This pass and this space journey is not going to end in disaster. The second coming of Christ will accomplish what no scientist yet has dreamt possible. Our Lord will deliver us from the clutches of death. God's end time plan is revealed in his word. This is what gives us confidence to stand on the scriptures. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. The mountain peak of the prophecies in the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, is the second coming of Jesus Christ. When you look at the book of Revelation, there is one central theme, and that is Jesus. It is not the dragon. It is not even the seven-headed beast. The great prophecies of the book of Revelation do not focus on the beast, but on Jesus Christ. These prophecies describe the return of our Lord and the climax of history. Notice the pattern. Revelation 14:14. 14, 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. When the book of Revelation pictures the coming of Christ, it pictures him coming with a crown on his head. He comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Bible does not picture Jesus coming secretly or silently. He came silently once as a baby born in Bethlehem's manger. Very few knew he was coming. When the Bible describes him coming in the book of Revelation, the picture is not the same. He comes with a crown of gold on his head. He comes with a sharp sickle in his hand to reap the harvest of the earth. The Bible always pictures Christ coming in power and glory. When you look in the book of Revelation, it always pictures him coming in majesty. Revelation 19 and verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Revelation 19, 14, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, and fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Why does the Bible picture Jesus coming on a white horse? What does that symbol represent? A white horse is a symbol of purity, victory, and triumph. When Jesus comes with a crown of gold upon his head, riding a white horse, he's pictured as victorious, riding general. He's pictured as coming to defeat all the forces of evil. The book of Revelation is a very, very, very plain book. Jesus returns victoriously, triumphantly, and gloriously. Revelation 11:15 The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. When Jesus comes, the great controversy will end. Sin and sinners will be no more. Jesus' coming is not some mysterious event. He comes to reign over the entire universe. He comes to be worshiped and praised by the redeemed forever and ever and ever. There are two very important questions that many ask concerning the second coming. Number one, how will Jesus come back the second time? Number two, how can I know that I will be ready when he comes? The Bible gives very clear answers to both questions. God's end time plan is revealed in his word. The Bible is very plain. Jesus describes one of the deceptions before his return this way. Luke 17, 23. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. In other words, if anybody says Jesus comes secretly to a select few or is appearing someplace anywhere on earth, we can know these claims are false. Someone may say he's in Tokyo or New York City. Or perhaps he's somewhere in Miami. Some will say, here he is, or there he is. 
don't go running off after them. Luke 17, 24 is clear. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Christ won't suddenly appear on a talk show in New York or as a miracle worker on the streets of Miami. He won't walk down some major street in our city. He won't hold up his hand saying, I am the Messiah. His coming is like lightning which flashes and lights up the sky. Christ's coming down from above. He won't be rising up from below. Christ is coming and he's coming with glory. But someone says, is it really necessary to know all of this and to understand all of this? If I love Jesus, isn't that enough? Satan attempts to deceive people and many are deceived. He is the great deceiver. He counterfeits the truth to lead millions astray. But Jesus clearly reveals his plan. Let me share with you some very clear facts about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Firstly, Christ's coming will be a literal event. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus ascends. The power of gravity cannot hold him down. He ascends higher and higher still and higher. As the disciples gaze up at Jesus in wonder, the Bible says, this same Jesus who is taken from you into heaven will come in like manner. They saw him go, they will see him come. A real Christ ascended and a real Christ will descend. Who am I talking about? This Jesus who healed the sick. This Jesus who fed the 5,000. This Jesus who raised the dead. This Jesus who ascended and he will return. Christ's coming will be a visible event. The Bible says the coming of Jesus will be a visible event. His ascension was visible, and when he descends, it will be visible. The book of Revelation says in Revelation 1-7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. How many people will see Jesus when he comes? Every eye. Who will see him? Every eye. Is Jesus coming secretly to just a chosen few? What does the Bible say? Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Christ's coming is a literal event. Christ's coming is a visible event. The Bible says Christ's coming will also be an audible event. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible is clear. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Here is some good news. He comes literally, a real Christ. He comes. He comes visibly, and every eye will see him. He comes. Here is good news. He comes audibly, and every ear will hear him. He comes. Have you lost a loved one by death? A little baby that you've laid in the grave? A son or a daughter who's been hit by a car and killed? Let me tell you something. That grave is marked by God. The Bible says the Lord himself shall descend with a shout. And that shout will pierce the tomb of every believer. Some might think that a preacher is loud when he yells his voice. But I yelled deliberately just to show you. That cannot compare to the shout that will pierce the tomb of every believer. It says with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the trumpet of victory, the trumpet of triumph, the trumpet of conquest over death. The Bible says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's good news. One day Jesus will say, John, come forth. Mary, come forth. Chad, come forth. Doreen, come forth. Puki, come forth. Shaniqua, come forth with the new resurrected body. That loved one will come out of the tomb and be caught up in glory and immortality as well to meet Christ in the air. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. With whom? With them. 
with whom? The righteous dead who are resurrected. The righteous dead who have been sleeping in their graves. We will be caught up, the Bible says, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Notice, if you will, the intimacy of these words. Notice that these words are saturated with love. Does Jesus come to live upon the earth at this time? No, no, no. We don't meet him on earth. We meet him where? In the air. The Bible says in Matthew 24, 26, therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. The Bible says Satan will masquerade as Christ working mighty miracles. But look, suppose someone says, Jesus is at the American Airlines Arena just before the Miami Heat play. Go there. He's a being of dazzling, a being of dazzling brightness. Go there. The Bible says don't go. As convincing as it might sound, do not go there. Because when the real Christ comes, he will come streaming down the corridor of the sky. Christ's coming will be a glorious event. Matthew 24, 27, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. God will perform a dazzling light show in the sky. He will stream down from the sky with 10,000 times 10,000 angels. Only Christ is the life giver. Only Christ can resurrect the dead. The real Christ is coming in the sky. The real Christ is coming to resurrect the dead. The real Christ will catch us up in the sky to travel with him past the moon, past the stars, past the sun, and to the throne room of the universe. And we will always be with the Lord. Matthew 24, 30 declares the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Christ's coming is like lightning that flashes from the east to the west. He appears in the sky to all the tribes of the earth. And Revelation 1, 7 tells us that every eye will see him. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it's not only believers who will see him when he comes. When Christ comes the second time, every eye sees him. Every ear hears him. I want to declare that there are only two classes of people when Jesus comes. The saved and the unsaved. The redeemed and the lost. Either you're directed by God or driven by the devil. Either you're influenced by Jesus or infested by the devil. Either you're sanctified by a Holy Spirit are desecrated by an evil spirit. There is no middle ground of neutrality. There is no straddling the fence when it comes to spiritual things. There is no second chance when Christ comes again and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The Bible is clear, they will see. The Bible says they will see, that is the nations of the earth, the Son of Man coming in glory. Jesus comes, I reiterate, literally, visibly, audibly, and Jesus also comes gloriously. Did you know that Christ's coming will be a climactic event? The coming of Christ is the decisive event in human history. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53 declares, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is a climactic event. This is a dramatic event, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Can you imagine? When Christ comes streaming down the corridor of the sky, the earth is illuminated with the glory of God. The ground rumbles, the buildings shake, the lightning flashes, the thunder crashes. 10,000 times 10,000 angels speed with the haste and, and, and the dispatch to graves as righteous believers come forth. Their bodies do not have the curse of sin. They're no more deaf ears. They're no more blind eyes. They're no more arthritic limbs. They're no more diseased bodies. They're no more victims of cancer or heart disease. As believers, we are looking up. Christ is coming.
This is the most magnificent event in the heavens. Instantly, our mortal bodies, which are subject to disease and death, receive immortality. What a day! Christ comes. What a day! Instantly, we are transformed. Instantly, we are changed. New life pulsates through our bodies. We radiate with health and joy and gladness and happiness. As Christ ascends in glory, we sing his praises as our bodies are changed from corruptible to incorruptible. Revelation 15:3. great and marvelous are your works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. We see the dead resurrected. We see our brother, sister, our son, our daughter, our husband, our wife come out of the tomb with new glorious immortal bodies. Angels present them to us again. We embrace with tears flowing down our cheeks. We ascend together. Picture this scene. Loved ones embracing. Families are reunited. This is the greatest drama of the ages. We see loved ones coming out of the grave and we're singing, Great and marvelous are your works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. We see him coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We cry out. Behold, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he will save us. We've waited for him. We've not accepted the false Christ. We've not accepted the counterfeit Messiah who pretended he was Christ. This is our Jesus who comes. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 6, and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Our eternal destiny is being settled by the choices we make tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I truly believe that's why I'm here in Florida City, in Homestead, Miami. I believe we are living on the knife edge of eternity. We are living in the days just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. I believe that soon Jesus is going to stream down the corridor of the sky. Let's summarize the events that take place at his return. What happens when Jesus comes? Seismic upheavals. First, there will be stupendous seismic upheavals. Mountain and islands will be moved out of their places and a great earthquake will shake this planet. The righteous dead are going to be raised. Paul tells us in Thessalonians, the dead in Christ shall rise first. All who sleep in their graves will hear Christ's trumpet-like voice and rise up to eternal life. Thirdly, the righteous living are going to be changed. Fourthly, immortality will be bestowed. Fifthly, the wicked living will be destroyed. In Revelation 6, 14 and 15, the wicked call for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus comes, I reiterate, there will be no second chance, no second opportunity. When Jesus comes, the wicked living are destroyed. Sixthly, the righteous are going to welcome Christ. The Bible says, when Christ comes, we are caught up to meet him in the air. The righteous, number seven, will go to heaven. But some people say, didn't you miss the text, Ron, in the Bible that says he's coming as a thief? Now, folk, I've got thieves in my family. And I'm going to tell you something. Thieves don't want you to know what they're doing. They're sneaky. Somebody asks, isn't he coming as a thief? And aren't there two comings of Christ? And when one comes as a thief and the other one, when he comes in glory? Some ask that. Some segue into the question, then what about... The secret rapture. Matthew 24, 36. The Bible says, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24, 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Is this text speaking about the manner of his coming or the time of his coming? When the Bible talks about a thief, it is talking about the time he comes, not the manner in which he comes. That's pretty plain to me. Now, I told you I've got thieves in my family, folk. They don't announce to you that they're going to hit you and shake you down or rip you off. They just succeed. Does a thief cup his hands around his mouth and call out warning like, hey, here I come, get ready. 
I'm getting ready to rob your house. No, he comes when we least expect it. Quickly, rapidly. When Jesus comes as a thief, the world would not expect it either. He comes quickly, unexpectedly. Then every eye will see him. The Bible doesn't teach that he comes secretly as a thief, not at all. Notice verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Second Peter 3.10 declares, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. When? When is that going to happen? When he comes as a thief. The second coming is a surprise to the unprepared. You see, the prepared knows he's going to come. The unprepared are surprised. What happens to them? What about the expression, one taken and the other left? Luke 17, 36, two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. Does the text say that the one who is left is left alive? That's what man puts in that. It's not what the text says. Jesus goes on and says this, Luke 17, 26, as it was in the days of Noah. Now, there were two classes in the days of Noah, was there not? Yes. Was one class taken in the days of Noah? Yes. Was one class left in the days of Noah? Yes. What happened to the class that was left in the days of Noah? They were destroyed by the flood. Jesus continues, Luke 17, 28, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. What happened in the days of Lot? Was one class taken out of the city? Yes. As it was in the days of Noah, there were two classes, one saved, one alive, that is ascending to meet Christ, one lost, meaning one dead, destroyed at Christ's coming. As the days of Lot, one class out of the city, saved, one class left and destroyed. Revelation is plain about this division of the world at the second coming of Christ. Revelation 6, 15 through 17 declares, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? How tragic. He comes to save them, but they run and hide. They hide themselves. Their hearts are gripped with fear. Tragic. Because he chose not to delight himself in the things of God. Tragic. Because he was so near and yet so far. Tragic. Because he suffered from spiritual myopia. He could only see the short range benefits of time instead of the longevity of God's eternity. Tragic. Because his name could have been inscribed in glittering gold in the hallowed halls of heaven. Now his name is inscribed in infamy, written in a flaming fire. Tragic, because he could have been a somebody, but he ended up a nobody. Tragic, because his name will be an enigma, a blot on the fair page of Christianity. Tragic to the names of King Saul, Ahab, and Jezebel, Ananias, and Sapphira, and Judas. Also, write the name Procrastinator. What a tragedy. They have not crowned him as the King of Glory in their hearts today, so they don't want to crown him as the King of Glory in the universe. They run. They're frightened. They cry for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. So when the Bible describes the second coming of Christ, one of the greatest deceptions is that some will be left on earth and have a second chance during the tribulation. The devil has sold that lie, incidentally, to deceive people to procrastinate, to put off their salvation. They think, I can put off my salvation and during the tribulation I can get serious. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the book of Revelation and according to the teaching of Jesus, there is no second opportunity. The time to get serious about your salvation is now. Christ's coming will be a joyous event. Don't put it off to some future date. Don't delay it to some more seasonable hour or convenient time. Don't miss the most joyous event of the ages. When Christ comes, it will certainly be a joyous event.
It will be the happiest event in the history of the ages. Jesus in John 14, 2 makes it clear. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus comes bursting down the corridor of the sky. Here is a family that laid their baby in the grave. But right now there's a rumbling, lightning flashes. They look up and they see Jesus coming. Lightning flashes from the east to the west. An angel comes and the dead are resurrected. And mama holds that baby in her arms once more. Is there anything, ladies and gentlemen, tonight that would keep you, my friend, from being ready, keep you from being ready for the coming of Christ? Just think about it. A husband witnesses to his wife or someone to a friend, but they say, no, this is just a fairy tale. They tell you Christ will never come. But one day I got news for you. Christ will come. He will stream down the corridor of the sky and take us home with him. They're only the saved and the lost on that day. The righteous and the unrighteous on that day. They're only those who look up and say, this is our God. And those who cry for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. There's only one thing, ladies and gentlemen, that can satisfy today and forever. And that is Jesus Christ. This is not a fairy tale. This is not make believe. This is reality. One day, Jesus Christ will come and he wants to save you. Would you like to say tonight, Jesus, please save me. Jesus, I believe you are coming in the clouds of heaven and I want to be ready. Will you bow your head with me if that's your desire? And by bowing your head, you're saying, Jesus, save me. I want to be ready when you come. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we recognize that you're coming. We look around, we see it in this COVID-19 dynamic. We see it in the nuclear weaponry that's threatening us around the world. We see it in officials who are confused and leaders of countries who are at stalemates in terms of interaction. We see, oh God, in the politicism dynamics of our country. We see it in the election processes. We see it in police brutality. We see the evidence, Lord, that this world as we know it through capricious weather, volcanic eruptions, Lord, we see that the world we live in really can go, not, cannot go on much longer. We see it. We know you're coming. And we determine tonight that we don't want to miss out on the glorious opportunity of transitioning from time into eternity. We, we spend so much time trying to preserve the three score years, the 10 that you give us on this planet, the three score, the 70 years, and if by reason of strength we get a few more, they are often punctuated with sorrow and discouragement. But Lord, that compares, that's in contrast to eternity. We're a thousand years about a day in your sight. Oh God, we want to live forever. We want to be in eternity with you. And we know that you're about to intercept time with eternity. We know that soon you're about to change the current course of this world's history. How soon, Lord, we can't express it, but we know that you're even at the door. So now we want to be ready. We don't want to allow our jobs, our relationships, our choices to quarantine us from the glorious privilege that we will have and the joy that can be ours to be ready when you come. Sometimes sickness is in the way. Our bodies are broken down and we can't focus on you the way we hope because we're busy trying to survive because of physical ailments. We pray that you will touch sick bodies tonight. And then Lord, I pray in a special way that you will touch people who have financial problems tonight. And then Lord, I'm hoping in a very special way that you will seize the opportunity to bless relationships that are strained tonight. And then, Lord, there are people who are carrying heavy burdens and hard to break habits. I pray that you will set them free tonight. So there are a lot of people, oh Lord, who are having problems. But tonight, as we prepare to go to our, to our breakout rooms, I pray, Lord, as the pastor ushers us into a special place virtually to pray and to decide to accept our Lord. I beg you, oh Lord, to please give us relief and sweet release from the hardships that we face. We don't want any barriers standing in our way. We don't want any obstacles to overcome. 
to keep us in a position of readiness for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. We want to be ready. We want to live poised. We long for you to usher us in out of this dark world into a better place. Let it happen for us, we beg, in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, folk. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That message, that prayer has made me know I can make it at least one more day. There's somebody here that needs some prayer. It may be for you. It may be for a loved one. But you need some intercessory prayer. But since our prayer room is open, the number is on the screen. We have prayer warriors already there waiting to pray for you. I will be there and join you in one moment. And we will pray together. So if you have a special prayer request, please meet us in that prayer room. The number is on the screen. Before we go, don't forget, make sure you register each and every night. Systemforsurvival.com. We desperately want to get to know you. We want you to be in the drawing. And we want to know how we can help you survive. Because as we have been learning night after night, with the word of God, we can survive. I will see you in that prayer room. God bless you.
know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family, in your children, and their children, and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May his favor be upon you.
If you are in the dark, hold on Miami and Florida City. Help is on the way. System for Survival returns to Miami, Florida City. Join Dr. Ron C. Smith, 7 p.m. nightly, and this time it's virtual. Join us 7 p.m. nightly in your car, at home, at work, or wherever you are June 5th through the 26th. 7 p.m. nightly, Dr. Ron C. Smith removes the darkness and answers the questions and reveals the light of what's happening in our day. System for Survival, June 5th through the 26th, 7 p.m., a virtual revelation on what's happening in our world today. There are many ways to connect, call, log on, or view. System for Survival, June 5th through the 26th. Hold on, help is on the way. If I were you, I'd answer this one. You're watching System for Survival in the 21st century with Dr. Ron C. Smith on the System for Survival Digital Video Network.